Zoe, what part about marriage do you think you're expected to play? Well, I think I'm expected to like play as many parts as I can, like making money through work and like helping around the house and like cleaning and stuff and cooking. Zach, what do you think about that question? I think uh, my part would be to help out around the house and to try to provide for the family. Zoe, what do you think about marriage when it's presented to you? I think marriage is like two people who just have like an unconditional love for each other, just kind of like growing and spending time together. Croesus, what do you think elementary age kids think about marriage in our current generation? Well, I think the elementary school children in our generation are, um, think of marriage as a man and a woman come together and they take life on together and they um, do what, do everything together. They all stick together through even the hard times. What aspects of marriage are kids looking forward to when they grow up? I think an aspect of marriage that kids are looking forward to when they grow up is someone to always be there for them when they need them the most. Asher, what do you think about marriage? Um, it's about um, being nice to each other and loving each other. Do you want to get married someday? Yeah. What do you think you would like about marriage? Um, walking around. Well, hey, my name's Billy. I'm the middle school minister at Greenford Christian Church, and this, uh, this project that we've been doing is awesome. We've heard so many perspectives from different kids and their views on marriage, and each kid coming from a, a different perspective, having both mom and dad still together, some um, having a father who's absent. Uh, there's just so many different um, ways that kids are growing up learning about marriage and having expectations for themselves when, when they get married. Um, I myself grew up in a family where my parents divorced uh, at an early age, and for the most part I was raised by a single mom. Um, and I married into a family where my wife's parents are now still together, um, and her both sets of her grandparents were still together. And so there's so many different things in our lives growing up, and, and for children, that they're going to have so many different views of marriage. Um, and one thing um, that I've learned over the years is God's view and God's intention for marriage is one of the most precious things um, ever. God created the covenant of marriage uh, to be the closest thing that we have on this earth that resembles and illustrates God's covenant with His people. And there was a covenant in, in the Old Testament that God made with His people, but then God made a new covenant in the New Testament with His people. And the closest thing that we have to that visually, the thing that we can learn from the most, is the covenant of marriage between a man and a woman. In the same way that Christ sacrificed Himself for the sake of His church, husbands are to sacrifice themselves as they love their wives. In the same way that the church body submits to the headship and leadership of Jesus, wives are to submit and, and honor their, their husbands as the head of the house. And this is exactly what Paul was talking about when he's writing a letter to the Ephesian church. Um, he sends a letter to them knowing that they were struggling to find unity, not just as a church, but in their households too as husbands and wives. And so in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, Paul starts out by saying, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so before Paul even mentions the covenant of marriage, he's telling us all that as, as a body of Christ, we need to submit to one another just like Jesus submits to the Father in heaven while he was here on earth. And in that same way, the, the body of Christ submits to Jesus and we submit to one another. And then he continues, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. And a lot of times I think that we put so much weight from this passage on, on wives, that they're to submit, to submit, to submit, to honor, to honor, to honor. And we'll find out the next verse, there is actually equal weight given to the husbands in their role as, as a husband to a wife. 
Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Now, I don't know about anybody else from any other perspective of marriage, but I know that for me as a husband, and also as a minister to, to the church, there is a lot of weight in what Paul just said, not only for how husbands are to love their wives, but sometimes that brings a whole new meaning to how Christ loves us, the church. And so Paul's telling husbands that the same way that Jesus here loves the church, they are to love and, and honor and respect their wives in that same manner. Most of which, all of us as husbands, especially myself, we really tend to fall short. But this is a picture that's painted for us by God through Paul's words that the, the gospel is shown through a husband and a wife and how they treat each other. The, the gospel being the love of, of God that he has for his people and what he is willing to do for his people, for his church. In that same way, husbands should be showing that same kind of love to their wives. And in verse 28, it says, In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body. But they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. And for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you should also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. And it's a beautiful thing that God's created this covenant of marriage. He's created marriage to show the rest of the world, this is what it looks like for God to love his people. So the same way you see a husband loving his wife, it's preaching or showing the gospel to everyone around him. The same way that a wife submits and, and loves her husband is also showing this is how God loves us, but this is also how the church is to submit to God. And so it's a, it's like a blank canvas and God is using the covenant of marriage to show everybody, this is what, this is how much I love my people. This is how much a husband should love his wife, and this is how much a wife should love her husband. And you see this all throughout the scripture, um, that God has this intent for marriage, but all over the scriptures you have different perspectives of marriage as well, people messing the marriage up. Um, you have David having a guy who is after God's own heart at, at one point also messes up and he doesn't display he doesn't display God's love in the way that it should be, and he he has an affair himself. You you see all sorts of different stories that people um, don't illustrate it the way that God has intended it to be illustrated, and we see that now today. That's why we have so many kids from different perspectives on marriage, and we need to not uh, forget what God has intended it for. And we see this in the book of Hosea in the Old Testament. God raises up this prophet, Hosea, and he's a faithful man. And God asks Hosea, go and marry this girl named Gomer. And Gomer, for a living, uh, she, she gave herself up as a prostitute. And God said, Hosea, I want you to marry Gomer. I want you to be faithful to her even when she is not faithful. And to make a long story short, he marries Gomer, and then eventually Gomer is unfaithful. Gomer finds herself being sold into slavery, and God tells Hosea to go chase after her. Go, go chase after your bride. Get your bride back. And Hosea does. Hosea goes and, and, and purchases his bride, Gomer, out of slavery. And the first thing that Gomer thinks is, what in the world are you doing? I have been so unfaithful to you, and yet you still would purchase me back. The whole book of Hosea is all about God trying to show not only Hosea, but us about his unfailing, 
always faithful love. That Hosea would always be faithful to Gomer, would always um, honor her and respect her and, and, and love her, even when she doesn't love him back. And it's an example to us that wives should be faithful to their husbands to, um, to unconditional lengths. And that husbands should honor and love and respect their wives to the, to the same length. Because when we do that, we're showing the world what the love of God looks like. And so, in the Bible, God's display of marriage and what, it, what He's intended it to be, He's displaying His love for us. He's displaying the gospel. And that's what we see. It's, it's the gospel perspective of marriage. It's the way that it was intended to be, the way that God wrote it to be, the way that God authored it to be. Zach, what do you think marriage is supposed to be? I think marriage is supposed to be uh, a great thing that two people uh, can connect and they can just be together. Let the children speak. Let the children speak. Let the children speak. Let the children speak. Parents, let your children speak.